So today I'm going to talk to you about introduction to radiation biology. Uh, my name is uh, Christian or Christiane Burton, and I am a diagnostic medical physicist uh, at the uh, at Boston Children's Hospital. But I'll be giving this talk at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So this is just an outline of what I will be talking about. Um, you know, basically going from understanding the types of radiation uh, to how they cause a uh, biological effect and then how we can use this information uh, when we're doing treatment planning. So what is radiobiology? It is the study of the action of ionizing radiation on living organisms and the action involves physics, biology, and even some chemistry. And there are different types of ionizing radiation like alpha particles, uh, beta particles, neutrons, photons, protons. It also involves the energy absorbed at the atomic and molecular level, which leads to uh, biological damage. So, and then there's also repair of the damage in uh, living organisms. So there's repair mechanisms for uh, DNA, for example. And these basic principles are used in radiation therapy with the objective to treat cancer with minimal damage to the normal tissue. So let's start off with the types of ionizing radiation. So radiation is classified into two main categories. Non-ionizing radiation, so one that cannot ionize matter, so cannot kick an electron out of the uh, atomic shell, for example, to create an ion. And then there's ionizing radiation, which can ionize matter. And that's the one we're interested in. So there's two major categories of ionizing radiation. Uh, one is the directly ionizing radiation, which is basically due to charged particles, uh, the Coulomb in force, uh, the Coulomb-Coulomb interaction. Uh, so this involves electrons, protons, alpha particles, heavy ions, and these basically deposit their, their dose right away. Then there's indirect ionizing radiation, which is neutral particles, so particles that don't have a charge. And that, that includes photons, which can be x-rays or gamma rays, and neutrons. And basically they interact with charged particles that deposit their dose. So in my diagram uh, down here, I have um, a photon coming in to the atom and it's basically kicking the electron out, uh, therefore ionizing the atom. So these uh, different types of radiation interact with matter quite differently. Um, if we go on the left here, I have an alpha particle, which is a heavy charged particle. And I have a, a beta particle, which is essentially an electron. It's a lighter charged particle relative to the um, alpha particle. I have a, a photon, or a gamma ray, as uh, a photon. Um, it's a light uh, neutral particle. And then I have a heavy neutral particle, which is a neutron. So if we go back up to the alpha particle, uh, basically what happens is when it interacts with matter, uh, it doesn't go very far because it's a large charged particle, so the chances of it interacting with um, an, another atom in the material is, is a lot higher because of its size. So it will deposit its dose uh, more readily along the way, um, and it will eventually get absorbed completely in the material. Alpha particles are actually so easy to stop. You can stop them with a, a piece of paper. And then you have a, a beta particle, which is an electron. And what the beta particle does is it, when, it, when it interacts with matter, is it can interact with another electron and that electron can go on and deposits, deposit its dose along the way until it com is completely absorbed by the medium. Or um, it can interact with a, a nucleus and basically as it impinges on the nucleus, it will come in at an angle uh, where it will give off um, a photon as you can see here. And the energy of this photon um, is dependent on the angle that it uh, interacts with the nucleus. So after it creates a photon, um, the electron can still go on to deposit dose and then eventually get absorbed by the medium. This photon can either go on to interact with an electron or it can escape uh, the medium completely, depending on its energy. And then we have a, a photon here, which is you know similar to the one I just described. Um, so this is a, a gamma ray, and basically when it interacts with matter, it'll uh, interact with an electron and basically kick it out of its shell, 
and that electron will interact with the material and deposit its dose completely. And this photon will be scattered, um, and it might go on to interact with another electron, and that will that electron will deposit its dose uh, completely. And it might the photon actually might leave the matter. Um, if the photon has enough, just enough energy to kick an electron out of the K shell, a uh, photoelectric effect will occur, and then the photon will be completely absorbed uh, within the material. Then there's uh, the nu the neutron, which is a heavy neutral particle, um, and that'll interact with a proton um, as part of neutron capture, um, and the photon will be let let off, um, and an electron will be absorbed. So charged particles interact strongly and ionize directly, and neutral particles interact less, um, ionize indirectly, and penetrate further. And so as you can see here um, on the right, um, gamma rays and x-rays are the ionizing radiation. Um, they have the smallest wavelength, uh, the highest frequency, and uh, the highest uh, photon energy. If you go down to the radio waves, um, the wavelengths are pretty long, and uh, they have a they don't have a, a very high frequency com relative to the other um, to uh, gamma rays and x-rays um, and they have less energy as well. So if radiation is absorbed in biological material, ionizations and excitations occur in a pattern that depends on the type of radiation involved. So depending on how far the primary ionization events are separated in space, Radi radiation is characterized as sparsely ionizing x-rays or densely ionizing like alpha particles. So the sparsely ionizing, uh, which is the low LET, is when um, a low amount of energy is deposited per unit length. And then densely ionizing um, is when you have a, a high amount of energy deposited per unit length. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So heavier particles with larger uh, charge uh, produce higher ionizing, ionization density. For a given particle type, the density of ionizing, ionization decreases as the energy and velocity goes up. So this, is, this brings us to the linear energy transfer, and I pulled this uh, definition directly from the ICRU document, uh, International Commission on Radiation Units. Um, so the linear energy transfer is the average energy locally imparted to the medium by a charged particle of specified energy in traversing a distance. So this is the equation for uh, the linear energy transfer. It's the amount of energy that is transferred to the medium over a, over a, a, a certain length. So this doesn't talk about how the energy is absorbed. This is just talking about how the energy is transferred. And the LET, as we call it, um, this is the acronym, is used to define the quality of ionizing radiation beam. Uh, the unit is KeV per micrometer. Um, KeV is just a, an easier number to work with. Um, sometimes we deal with MeV, but um, KeV is useful. And micrometer, just because of like the distance that we're interested in. Uh, this is different from the stopping power, and you might have heard the stopping power, um, which is basically the retarding force of charged particles due to the interaction with matter. That's also not um, a, an indication of how the energy is absorbed by the medium. It has more to do with the material itself. So LET is an average quantity um, and is typically track averaged. So there's two ways that you can calculate the LET. Um, the first one is track average, as I mentioned. Uh, so it's calculated by dividing the track into equal lengths and averaging the energy deposited in, in each length. Um, this is good because then the, the track, you know, like the track remains constant, and you you just have to worry about the energy. So, and this is so you can compare uh, both uh, different um, types of radiation. So here you can see that the track has been. Um, divided into equal lengths, and then basically just take the average of the energy uh, deposited in each track. Then the energy average is calculated by dividing the track into equal energy intervals and averaging the length of the track that contains this amount of energy. So, you know, keeping the energy the same, but then, um, you know, deciding where these track, what the track lengths should be. Um, so that's a little bit it's a little bit easier to use the track average, and I understand why they use it. And just some typical LET values um, that are commonly used. So 
uh, for a 250 kvp x-ray the let is uh, about two and then the one mev electrons oh sorry the three mev uh, x-rays if we want to compare is 0 0.3 kev per micrometer so if we compare the three mev x-rays to the uh, 250 kvp x-rays you can see that when the energy is higher the x-ray kind of it penetrates further um, into the medium and it interacts less with the electrons so the let is going to be uh, smaller and if we look at a really high energy electron at one mev the let is pretty much the same as that so 0 0.25 so even though this is a charged particle and the x-ray is not um, if you have a high enough energy, um, it also won't, the likelihood of it depositing its dose um, at that energy is, is pretty, is still kind of low. And if we look at LET values um, for other less common radiations, so like a 14 MeV neutron, um, so again, large charged particle that interacts with uh, protons, uh, the LET is uh, 12 keV per micrometer. And then heavy charged particles is about 100 to 200. And then you have the uh, low, very low energy um, electron, so one keV electron. The LET is about 12.3, and then for 10 keV, uh, it's about 2.3. So the lower the energy of the electron, um, the it, the lesser it will tr it will penetrate in the medium and deposit its dose uh, uh, more directly. And so why do we care about LET? And this is where we're getting into the biology a little bit. So if we look at the uh, a beta particle with an LET of 0 0.2 keV per micrometer, you can see that the number of interactions or ionize ionizations or excitations um, is kind of low. And if we look at an alpha particle with an LET of 50 to 230 keV per micrometer, um, we can see that the chances of interac interaction with uh, the DNA is, is quite high compared to the beta particle. So there's a higher chance that an alpha particle will interact and uh, actually do some damage to the DNA compared to the beta particle. And the optimal LET is actually about 100 keV per micrometer um, in terms of producing a biological effect. And as you can see here, um, when you get to 100 keV per micrometer, you get a double strand break. Um, you, still get this, you still get that with a 200 keV per micrometer but the 100 kV uh, will perfectly hit the two strands here. So at this density of ionization, the average separation in ionizing events is equal to the diameter of DNA double helix, which causes significant double strand breaks. And these double strand breaks are the basis of most biological effects. So you can see here, um, this, is, this is DNA that's intact, um, not damaged. You can get a single strand break um, here, but if you have a single strand break, the DNA can basically repair itself because it has a template. So it knows um, that the adenine needs to go here. You can also get another strand break over here, but again, the DNA can repair that because it has a template. And then you can have a double strand break, like I described before. And these are believed to be the most important lesions produced in chromosomes by radiation. So the interaction of double strand breaks can result in cell killing, carcinogenesis, or mutation. And so this brings us to the cell survival curves. Um, these are very useful, and I'll be talking about them. Um, they'll, I'll be using them throughout the talk. Um, basically, on the right here, we're looking at the surviving fraction, uh, which is a ratio as a, a function of dose. Um, the dose can be in, in rads, um, which are older units, or in gray, which um, are more up to date. So <clears throat> a cell survival curve describes the relationship between the radiation dose and the proportion of cells that survive, as you can see. So in, over here, um, what they've done is they have different assays, and they put a certain number of cells in them, um, then they choose different doses to radiate these cells and they have one control where they give no dose and basically after they've applied radiation they let it incubate for one to two weeks and then they uh, try to count how many cells have been left in the medium 
Um, and this is to, to determine the platine efficiency. So radiation dose, the cells will die over time. Um, so we're just trying to keep a control here. And you just get a, a platine efficiency so that you can calculate that. So you just take the surviving fraction and multiply it by the, uh, the platine efficiency. So if you come over here to the uh, cell survival curve, uh, you can see that x-rays are, are, are over here. You have tw uh, 12, oh, sorry, 15 MeV neutrons and then alpha particles. So um, it requires less dose to kill uh, off the cells for alpha particles than it does for uh, neutrons and x-rays. In fact, um, if you increase the LET, then it will require less dose um, to kill these cells. So that makes sense because alpha, ray, alpha rays will interact with the uh, DNA more readily. So the cell survival curves um, are also presented in the form uh, with the dose plotted on a linear scale. So this is a linear scale here and the surviving fraction on a log scale here. And the shape of the curves um, basically follow this linear quadratic model um, that assumes that there are two components of cell killing, um, only two adjustable parameters. Uh, there's no final straight portion that is observed experimentally, but an adequate representation of the data up to doses used as daily fractions in clinical therapy. So you can see here that um, in terms of chromosomes, you get a, a double strand, a double break here, um, and then uh, you have a, each a single uh, two breaks uh, due to two separate events here. And that's a quadratic part. And up here is the this is the linear part. So two breaks due to the same uh, event. So this brings us to relative biological effectiveness. So absorbed dose can be a poor indicator of the biological effect of radiation. Um, it doesn't give us an assessment of the risk. So this is something that documents like ICRP 60 and 130 talk about when they factor in um, weights of the radiation and the tissue type. So the biological effect can depend on many factors such as type of radiation, initial energy, and type of tissue. So uh, in these documents, the ICRP documents uh, that I mentioned, they will try to calculate the effective dose um, and, and the equivalent dose, and they'll take into account uh, the weight of the radiation. So an alpha particle would, uh, they give it a weight of 20, and a photon they give it a weight of 1. So if, you, if you're exposed to alpha particles, you have a higher risk. <clears throat> and then they also weight the type of tissue. So lungs, for example, weight at about uh, 0.12. And something like the thyroid weights at about 0 0.05. And the skin is like the least sensitive at 0 0.01. So lungs are the most sensitive. So um, for example, one gray of neutrons uh, produces a greater biological effect than one gray of x-rays just due to the difference in the pattern of energy d uh, deposition. The relative biological effectiveness um, is the ratio of biological effectiveness of one type of ionizing radiation relative to another given the same amount of absorbed energy. If you don't have a sense of what this means yet, um, I'm going to show you a graph in the, in the next slide. So the RBE is a, an empirical value, and it varies uh, with the type of ionizing radiation and the energies involved, and the biological effects, such as cell death and oxygen tension. And this is something I'm going to mention um, later on in the talk. So RBE compares uh, the test radiation R, so R meaning neutrons, alpha particles, even photons at different energies, with uh, 250 kV x-rays. And it's defined as RBE equal to the dose of 250 kV to DR. So DR is the absorbed dose of radiation of type R that causes the same amount of biological damage as D250 kV. So what does this look like on a cell survival curve? So if we look at, if we look at this curve here, the surviving fraction is a function of dose. Um, if we're comparing neutrons and x-rays, basically we're looking at the same surviving fraction <clears throat> and we're just taking the ratio of these two doses and this will give you the relative biological effectiveness so over here it'd be 5.6 and then as you increase the dose uh, for both neutrons and x-rays you'll see that the relative biological effectiveness um, decreases and I guess this graph over here 
just showed it a little bit better. So basically, you know, for the same survival fraction, we're comparing dose X and I. So in general, the RBE increases with LAT to reach a maximum RBE of 3 to 8, and that depends on the level of cell kill at an LAT of 100 keV per micrometer, um, and then decreases because of the energy overkill. So if we look at the RBE here, the RBE graph, and we look at how it varies uh, with LET. So just ignore the OER for now and focus on the RBE. As the RBE, um, the RBE will increase with LET, and basically it will, you know, peak at about 100 kV per micrometer, and then it will start to decrease because of energy overkill. And if you recall, um, the optimal LET when it comes to uh, DNA damage is 100 keV per micrometer. So this is the classic paradigm of uh, radiation injury. Um, and you know, th there's a bit of a time frame down here as to when, just to give you an idea of when these events occur. So if we start over here at ionizing radiation, uh, we can go down this path first. So excitations can lead to heat. Heat is uncomfortable, um, but there's not a large amount of damage uh, there in terms of you know in terms of DNA damage. We can have ionizations, so this includes free radical formation, which I'm going to speak about soon. Um, <clears throat> but we also have chemical repair, so ions can recombine with each other, and this occurs in in you know the span of seconds, on the order of seconds. <clears throat> the ionizations can lead to DNA damage. And I mean, the DNA can repair itself. There's enzymatic DNA repair. Um, and all this can, it, can occur uh, within minutes or hours. The DNA damage can go on to produce cell death. <laughs> so you can have a, an early acute effect uh, with like radiation sickness, um, which is basically like having diarrhea or vomiting. This can occur in a span of days. Um, you can have developmental effects in your fetus, uh, which can occur in the span of weeks and then late effects, um, which can occur in the span of months. These are more like, um, these, are, these are effects that actually, you know, you don't know you have until a little bit later. Um, more on the deterministic side of, of things. And then you have a DNA mutation. So uh, there, you go down like two lines here. There's the germ line, which, is, which are your germ cells or your sex cells. Um, and this, you know, damage to the germ line will affect will have a heritable effects, which will affect um, generations, so your offspring, their offspring. And then there's also somatic cells, um, which if there's DNA mutation, uh, this can lead to malignant transformation, and then eventually le uh, lead to cancer. And typically cancer has a latency period of, of years or even decades. So this is how this is kind of like how it occurs, how the biological effects will occur. So start off with incident radiation. The radiation is absorbed, and excitation or ionization will occur. So we've talked about these three already. Then there will be possibly free radical formation, most likely. Um, there's also direct effects, and we're going to talk about that next. And that'll lead to breakage of chemical bonds, and then that will lead to biological effects. So just to give you some numbers first. Um, and biological systems are very sensitive to radiation. Absorption of 4 gray in water produces the rise in, it, in temperature of 10 to the power of minus 3 degrees Celsius. So it's about 67 calories in a 70 kilogram person. The whole body dose of 4 gray given to a human is lethal in 50% of cases. So that's the LD, the lethal dose 50. The potency of radiation is in its concentration and the damage done to the genetic material of each cell. That shouldn't be surprising given the information uh, in this talk. The biological effect is expressed in cell killing or cell transformation, so carcinogenesis and mutations. The primary target of radiation is DNA, um, so suffering breaks in chemical bonds. And depending on the extent of the damage, it can be repaired through several repair mechanisms in place um, in a living organism. So let's focus on the cell first. All living entities are made up of protoplasm. Inorganic and organic compounds dissolved in water. 
The cell is the smallest unit of protoplasm capable of independent existence. So it's the basic microscopic unit of all uh, cell membrane, which is around the cell. And then within the cell, you have the protoplasm, which is all living materials within the cell. And that comprises of the nucleus, which is what we're interested in, and the cytoplasm, which is the liquid that surrounds the nucleus. The type of cell that we're talking about, so we have germline, uh, germ cells, which is basically the sperm and the ovum. Anything else is somatic cells. So, you know, here I'm going from fertilization to Jim Smith. Um, but Jim Smith has his own germ cells, so he's got his own sperm cells. So the effects of radiation on human population can be classified as either somatic or genetic, which is why that matters. So somatic effects are harm that exposed individuals suffer uh, during their lifetime, such as radiation-induced cancers like carcinogenesis, um, sterility, opacification of the eye lens, etc. Genetic or hereditary effects are radiation-induced mutations to an individual's genes and DNA that can contribute to the birth or defective um, descendants. So a cell nucleus contains a sensitive component for radiation-induced cell killing, not in the cytoplasm. When directly ionizing radiation is absorbed in biological material, damage to the cell may occur in one or two mechanisms. So there's, there can be direct or indirect. Direct is a little bit more easy to explain. So when a photon comes in, it, it will interact with an electron, and that electron will interact with the uh, DNA. Alternatively, an electron can just come in and interact with the, from the outside and interact with the DNA. Um, so this interaction that the photon goes through with the electron is, uh, is a form of a, like a Coulomb interaction. Um, and so this leads to a, <coughs> the, <coughs> it leads to a chain of physical and chemical events that eventually produ produce the biological damage and is a dominant process in the interaction of high LAT particles such as neutrons or alpha particles with biological material. Indirect action is when a photon comes in, interacts with an electron, and that in electron interacts with the uh, water and it forms free radicals. And then through diffusion, uh, those free radicals will interact with the biological material. So the cell is composed of 80% of water, um, which is why that's which is why it's possible. Um, indirect action can also be modified by chemical sen sensitizers or radiation protectors. And that's something I'm not going to talk about um, in, uh, in this talk, So just but just be aware that they exist. So for indirect action, uh, these are the bio basic bio radiochemical um, reactions um, that occur in the water. So basically the water, um, after an electron interacts with it, the water will go through this, you know, this chain here. Um, it can go down different paths, but basically it ends up, you know, with these types of molecules. And um, this one here, the um, hydrolyzed electron and the hydrogen and the um, hydroxy um, molecule, these are highly reactive species. And so about two thirds of biological damage um, by low LET radiation, so sparsely ionizing radiations, is due to indirect action, and one third is due to direct action. This is just kind of a time frame of you know all the events that occur. So um, there's the physics, the chemistry, and the biology. So you go from incident X-ray X photon to fast electron or positron. So that's uh, physical. Physical. You go from the fast electron or positron to the ion radical. That's also physical. You go to ion radical, uh, from ion radical to free radical, that's chemistry. Free radical to breakage of bonds, also chemistry. And then breakage of bonds to biological effect is bio bio biology, basically. So the physics of this process takes is on the order of like 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Uh, the ion radicals have a lifetime of the order of 10 to the minus 10 seconds. The free radicals have a lifetime of the order of 10 to the minus 5 seconds. And the step between the breakage of bonds and biological effect can take hours, days, or even years, or even decades. The chromosome um, is basically, you know, DNA molecules carry the, the genetic information. So chromosome um, is an organized structure of DNA and DNA-bound proteins um, serve to package the DNA and control its function. 
Uh, chromosomes are located mostly in the cell nucleus, and there's some amount in the mitochondria. But this is basically you know, the structure of it down here. Uh, this is what it looks like. And uh, you can get a, a translocation, which is basically when uh, these two parts here of the, of the chromosome uh, break off, and then they kind of reconnect because they're sticky parts, but they don't connect with the right chromosome. Um, the chromosome can just have a deletion, so all this DNA material here are just gone. Um, there can also be an inversion, so um, you know the chromosome it kind of breaks apart here and inverts. You can also have an insertion where some you know foreign material gets inserted into the chromosome. Uh, you can also have a ring chromosome, which is basically like when the top part here is cut off and then the bottom part is cut off, and then they they kind of form a ring with each other. Um, you also have the isochromosome and then the derivative chromosome. Um, so it's important that to note that the uh, cell actually goes through a lot of checkpoints first. So this is why we have to be aware of the cell cycle. Um, you can see here, uh, this is a cell cycle. Um, so you know there's an interphase period and then there's a mitosis where the cells actually divide and then there's cyto oh, cytokinesis um, when there's cell separation. So the G1 phase um, right here is when the cell increases in size and the cellular contents duplicate, um, excluding the chromosomes. Um, everything else is duplicated. Then it goes to the S phase. Um, so this is where DNA uh, replication occurs. So each of the 46 chromosomes is duplicated by the cell. Then it gets over here to the G2 phase. Um, the cell prepares for cell division. So the cell uh, will double check the duplicated chromosomes for error, making any needed repairs. And then the M phase um, is when mitosis uh, occurs, followed by cytokinesis, which is cell separation. So the formation of two identical daughter cells. And each of these um, phases, which we'll see later why this is important, each of these phases have different uh, sensitivities to radiation. So the mitosis phase is actually uh, the most sensitive, and the late S phase is uh, the most radio resistant. Um, and it kind of goes M, G2, G1, S phase, um, and then the S phase is broken into beginning and end, and where the end phase is more radio, resist radio uh, resistant. So, and we think it's more radio resistant um, because homologous, because uh, of the homologous recombination between sister chromatids to repair damage. So, um, if there's some sort of repair mechanism, it'll make it harder to destroy the the, D the DNA or the, the chromosome material. And just to give you an idea of uh, the timing, so uh, the cell cycle, which is the time between uh, successive divisions or mitosis. Um, it's different in uh, mammalian cells. Uh, well, it's it's on the order of 10 to 20 hours, and there's a little bit of a dis discrepancy for a reason. So the S phase is usually in the range of six to eight hours. The M phase is usually less than an hour, and the G2 phase is in the range of two to four hours. And then you have the G1 phase, and this is the most uh, variable phase. Um, it can be in the range of one to eight hours, depending on the type of cell. And during the cell cycle, the um, this cell will go through uh, a lot of checkpoints just to make sure that it's ready for division. Um, you can see all these like cyclin, um, <laughs> these molecular genes called cyclin. So the cell cycle uh, progression is controlled by a family of molecular checkpoint genes. Their function is to ensure the correct order of cell cycle events. Uh, the genes involved in radiation effects halt cells in G2 so that an inventory of chromosome damage can be taken and repair initiated and completed before the mitosis is, is attempted. Uh, cells that lack checkpoint genes are sensitive to radiation-induced cell killing and carcinogenesis, so very important. Um, and there's also different kinds of uh, mechanisms for, uh, for cell death. Um, just in case the cell decides that um, it's not good for division. So there's mitotic death, which is when the cells uh, die attempting to divide. 
and that's primarily because of the asymmetric chromosome aberrations, and that's the most common mechanism. The other way is apoptosis. Uh, this is something I haven't mentioned yet, but it's basically programmed cell death in cell separation in apoptotic bodies. The last one is bystander effect. This one is interesting because the cell, um, once it's affected, uh, it, it actually warns other cells. So it releases the cytotoxic uh, molecules to warn its neighboring cells that it's been affected and then they also decide what they need to do. Um, either commit apoptosis or, or continue to, to live on. This brings us to the concept of uh, fractionation and uh, you know why we use radiobiology um, or how we use radiobiology in radiation therapy. So radiation therapy has traditionally been um, a fractionated treatment course spread over several weeks. Um, it does take advantage of the differential repair abilities of normal tissue and malignant tissue. So um, it's important um, to note that we're not just dealing with you know tumor cells here, we're, we're dealing with normal tissue. And so here we have a surviving, well we have a, a cell survival curve again, so surviving fraction um, as a function of dose. And this is typically what I've been showing throughout the talk, this single dose, so just one hit basically and just ramp up the dose. Um, now if, if we split it into two, we'll see here that you have a split dose. Um, so the surviving fraction, as you can see, is um, a lot higher compared to the single dose. But there is a reason for that, and we'll get to that. Um, and just, rem just remember, we're not just dealing with the tumor cells, we're dealing with the normal tissue. So the concept of fractionation um, was first discovered by a guy named Rigaud, and uh, he did this experiment on a French ram. So a single dose of radiation um, was sufficient to sterilize a ram. Um, they needed to give it um, <clears throat> to this area here. Um, but doing that would also cause significant uh, skin toxicity. So what he, what he decided to do is give the same dose, um, but delivered over several fractions and the ram was sterilized and there was no skin toxicity. And this is just because of fractionation. So in the 1920s and 19, to 1930s, uh, Rigaud, he uh, extended the treatment um, to uterine cancer and it improved the outcomes. And then Coutal, in, um, I guess in the 1930s, uh, he applied this fractionated treatment uh, for the head and neck cancer. Um, and reduce the toxicity with better outcomes. So you've probably seen some of the alpha and beta, um, these variables on the graphs before. So um, I'll just talk a little bit about it. So if the, this is the, the linear quadratic model um, and this is the equation that is used for the cell survival curve. So um, you know, cell survival is dependent on the dose, but it's also dependent on these uh, variables called alpha and beta. And <clears throat> basically, alpha uh, describes the linear part, and beta describes more of the quadratic part. And th the ratio of alpha to beta gives the dose at which the linear and quadratic components of the cell killing are equal. So using alpha and beta ratios uh, to generate treatment schedules, employing different size doses per fraction in order to match the probability of causing a tissue injury. So the value of uh, the ratio alpha beta tends to be larger uh, for early responding tissues and tumors. So a dose of 10 gray uh, would be sufficient. Um, and it's lower for uh, late responding tissues. So a dose of two gray typically. So these uh, <clears throat> different cell lines, different tissues and tumors have different alpha beta ratio values. So alpha beta of a particular tumor or uh, tissue defines the dose of radiation at which the number of cells killed by a single hit equals the number of cells ki killed by two hits. So if you recall, um, this is a single hit here, this is the linear part, and then you have a, a, double, <clears throat> a double hit here. Uh, and this is the, the quadratic part. Um, so a high alpha-beta ratio mean, 
<clears throat> it's for most tumors, um, and early responding normal tissue. And then late responding tissues, like some tumors like the prostate, um, have low alpha beta ratios, so you can see that here as well. Um, they to 10 gray. And then from for late responding tissues, that ratio can range from 2 to 5 gray. So uh, fractionation has a profound effect on cell survival curves for low LET radiation and some for high LET. Um, you can see that the low LET here has more of the, the shape that we're looking, that we're typically uh, used to. The high LET just seems to have like a downward slope here, like a very linear slope. Um, and the main objective clinically is sparing of normal tissue by giving it time to repair sublethal damage. And typically, normal tissue repair mechanisms are much more effective than those of, of cancer cells. Um, we can also use this to calculate the biological equivalent dose. So that will indicate the quanti quantitative, indicate quantitatively the biological effect of any radiotherapy treatment, which will take into account uh, changes in dose per fraction or dose rate, total dose, and the new factor uh, overall time. So it'll actually measure the true biological dose by taking into account um, the number of fractions and the dose per fraction. So just as an example, I mean, this is the equation, but just as an example, if you want to give 72 gray, that's what you prescribe, and you want to do uh, 1.8 gray um, with you know 40 fractions, and you want to put that into this equation, um, for late responding, tissues, for example, you could use an alpha beta, beta ratio of 3. And you'll find that your BED will be 115.2 gray, over 40 fractions. And then for late responding tissue, the dose that you might give is uh, 84. Uh, the, the BED may be 84. That's over uh, 40 fractions. For, for This is for early responding tissue. So this is just a useful uh, way to calculate the BED. And that brings us to the concept of the four R's. So we know that fractionation of radiation dose typically produces better tumor control for a given level of normal tissue toxicity than a single large dose. Um, the radiobiological basis for fractionation actually depends on the four R's. So repair, reassortment, repopulation, and reoxygenation. So repair of sublethal damage to cells uh, between fractions caused by radiation. And this is both for you know, tumor and normal tissue. Then you have reassortment of cells into radiosensitive phases of the cycle, which we talked about. Um, and we'll sh kind of show how that factors into fractionation. There's repopulation or regrowth of cells between fractions, um, more useful for the normal tissue and reoxygenation of hypoxic cells to make them more sensitive to radiation. And this is more useful for the, the tumor cells. So there's a few repair mechanisms, um, you know, that can, that uh, take effect. Um, uh, you know, for both the tumor and the normal tissue. Um, so, you know, you want to repair, there's repair proteins or different types. Um, you want to repair deficient cells um, that are exquisitely uh, sensitive to ionizing radiation. <clears throat> and the differential repair abilities will affect the alpha-beta ratio. So, um, and there's different repair mechanisms at different cycles here, as you can see. Um, repopulation, so cells repopulate between each fraction of radiation. Uh, the differential repopulation will affect the survival curve. So if you just focus on this part of the curve, um, this is a surviving fraction, um, and this is the time. Basically, um, over time, if you, I mean, there's, I guess there's two events here where you radiate the cells. Um, but if you leave, you know, if you leave the cells alone, eventually they will proliferate or repopulate. Um, so there's just see a growth here in survival curve. And then there's reassortment. So I talked about how the um, different phases of the cell cycle were, would respond to radiation, where mitosis would be the most uh, radiosensitive, um, and then uh, the S phase, particularly the end of the S phase, would be the most radio resistant. Um, so here, if, say you radiate the cell and then you wait 
um, and you get to this point here, the cells have had enough time to kind of recycle. So down here, you may have, you know, killed a bunch of cells, um, and maybe the ones that are left are completely in S phase. So the cells will get into probably either the M or G1 phase. So they'll they'll get out of that S phase, and um, if you hit them with radiation again, the survival fraction will decrease. Um, and then if you give it enough time again, they will repopulate. The flat line is just to indicate if the cells were non-cyclic, but they, they always are. Then there's uh, ox reoxygenation, and this one requires a little bit of explanation. So um, you have the oxygen effect, which is the presence or absence of molecular oxygen within a cell that will influence the biological effect of radiation. So the oxygen enhancement ratio, the OER, is the ratio of doses without and with oxygen, so hypoxic versus well oxygenated cells, to produce the same biological effect. So the OER is equal to the dose to produce a given effect without oxygen over the dose to produce the same effect with oxygen. Um, so if we look at the survival, the surviving fraction here, survival curve, sorry, uh, this is surviving fraction as a function of dose again. Um, we have got two curves here. One is the aerobic, so this is the oxygenated cells, and then you have the anoxic, which is the um, hypoxic or non-oxygenated cells. So the OER will change um, over, over time. Um, you can see how it divides between anoxic and aerobic. So oxygen makes the damage produced by the free radicals permanent. Uh, that's something that it does. Um, the damage can be repaired in the absence of oxygen. Uh, so an oxygen enhancement ratio um, is equal to 3 for x-rays, uh, 1.6 for neutrons, and only 1 uh, for alpha particles. So having you know an OER around 1 um, is, is pretty good, it's ideal. And uh, as luck would have it, uh, the OER decreases as the LET increases and approaches an OER of 1 for an LET of about 150 kV per micrometer. So now if we're looking at the OER graph here, um, for low LET, the OER is quite high. But as the LET increases, the OER will still t start to decrease, um, which is good. And it kind of you know overlaps with the 100 kV per micrometer. Um, so again, that's that's lucky. And if you recall, that's the optimal, the LET of 100 kV per micrometer um, is optimal for double, str double strand breaks. Um, and then here, if we're looking at, you know, tumor reoxygenation, you have the blood vessel, um, oxygenated blood vessel um, with <coughs> transporting oxygen. Um, <coughs> And oxygen can diffuse at, at only about 70 millimeters from the blood vessel. So, you know, if you have, this is your, you have a necrotic cell up here. This is where uh, there's no oxygen up here. Uh, and then you have your tumor here. And it's about at 70 uh, millimeters. I think it should be, sorry, not 70 millimeters. It should be 70 micrometers. Um, so the cell tumors often outgrow their blood supply and they will become hypoxic and these cells not receiving oxygen and nutrients um, eventually become necrotic. So the reason why we need oxygenation, uh, reoxygenation, is because if, you know, if, if we're going to fractionate, basically um, the tumor contains a mixture of aerated and hypoxic cells. So a dose of x-rays uh, kills a greater proportion of aerated cells than hypoxic cells. So if you have your tumor here, um, well, this whole thing is your tumor, the aerated cells are on the outside, so oxygen can actually reach them. Hypoxic are on the inside. Um, irradiate the cell, or the tumor. Uh, it'll, it'll interact with the aerated cells, um, and then it'll remove them, and basically you'll be stuck with the hypoxic cells um, immediately after radiation. But then the reoxygenation will occur, and you'll see that um, these this tumor will have um, oxygenated cells on its surface again. So if you hit it with radiation, um, you'll kill those cells, and this tumor will eventually get smaller and smaller. So fractionation actually allows it uh, the tumor to reoxygenate, um, and it has a great influence on uh, on tumor response. 
So these are just some of the references that I used. Um, one popular one is from Eric Hall, uh, Radiobiology for Radiologists. Um, another book is Johns and Cunningham, The Physics of Radiology. Um, I also use the Pogorshak book uh, to, for, uh, for watching this video. Um, please leave a comment below um, if you have a question and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. And please feel free to subscribe to my channel. All right, thank you.